Welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I have on the show today somebody who I have so much respect for. I've known this guy for over a decade. He is an institution in the British comedy magic world. It is the one and only Dave Allen. Dave, how you doing, mate? Hello. Nice to see you, Craig. It's good to see you. You are you are busy. I mean, thank you so much for finding time to do this. And I, I was just talking to you off camera just before we started the interview, while most magicians have been sitting around getting their free money the last year, you're <laughs> like, you're like, no thanks, I'm just going to go and set up an entirely new business, Alan's e-bikes. You, you literally, I mean, it's just insane, but you're still doing magic. It, you know, he was yep. just saying to me, oh, I've got a virtual show after this, and you know, you're still just as busy doing magic, but you've set up this whole other business, and that kind of sums up the type of guy that you are, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> what, mad? I think it's probably, probably where, let's open up a retail shop when it's, we're about to go into a lockdown for three months. That's, that's kind of where my sort of brain was. But um, yeah, I, I'm very much, I'm never the person to sort of let the grass grow on his feet as the expression goes. I think that's the right expression. Um, and obviously, like all entertainers, I was devastated to lose all the business uh, last year. Um, and it was, you know, very upsetting to sort of cancellation after cancellation. I had multiple cruises booked. I had multiple big events, you know, booked in that all got cancelled. I had a, a 50, I think it was 57 date tour of holiday parks for uh, my double acts. They were all cancelled. So it was, it was, you know, obviously devastating. But then it was for everybody. This, that's nothing new for, for me. It was, you know, wasn't on my own. So in a way that kind of made you feel a bit better that you hadn't done anything wrong uh, because we were kind of all in the same boat. But I just, you know, whereas other people were getting sort of extra jobs on the side and, and doing bits and pieces, I just didn't really want to do that. I wanted to, I thought to myself that I wanted to try and do something else uh, that had a bit of longevity for the future as well. Um, that's that's where my head is at. You've been very good at, and we'll talk about this in the interview, but one thing you've been very good at is marketing yourself as mm. an entertainer. And mm. it's great to see that you've taken all of the skills that you've learned running a magic business and you've just gone, well, this is all transferable. So I'm going to transfer it into this business. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's very true. I mean, the, the thing about sort of the, the Alan's e-bikes, and we, you know, this is a magic talk, so I won't talk too much about it, but... You're quite right. What I wanted to do, though, with Alan's e-bikes is I wanted to create a business that was very much my it's got my splash of of, of ingenuity and in, into the business. But I wanted it to be able to run without me at the head focal point as well, because the problem is with Magic Dave, Dave Allen and Carl and Dave, my sort of three main sources of magic is the Dave part. That's they've, they've all got to be me or it doesn't work. Um, but with this kind of business, I can build it up and make it as as good as I possibly can. And then I can employ people to run it so I can go off and do what I also love, which is performing. Um, and that was really the whole point behind it is that I knew that, um, you know, the magic business would come back. It's going to take some time. Entertainment will be back. It's going to take a little bit of time, but it will come back. Um, and for the meantime, I can build up another business uh, that keeps me going. And, it's a, and it is a passion of mine. So um, e-bikes and, and tech and gadgets is all, all my passion anyway. So I'm just taking something else that I love and making it into something really, really special. And I think I have created something really special with this company. And we're doing really well. We've been, we've been open since January um, and it's going great. And I, I am really enjoying it. It is, it is like having a real job, though. <laughs> <laughs> not like not like being a magician that's for sure this is a real job i come in here at eight o'clock in the morning uh into the shop and open up and i don't leave here till you know sometimes gone six in the evening so uh it's, it's hard work <laughs> well, done really smart like you you've taken this opportunity what does this make possible and you've created this whole other income stream from it and i'm really glad we talked about this because there were rumors that i saw on the internet going oh dave's quit magic uh, and I was saying, no, he hasn't. He's just set up another bit. He's not quit. Exactly the opposite. I mean, with what you're doing on the circle and your virtual shows and every, you're just as busy doing magic than anyone else. But yeah, you decided to branch off and do something. I, I don't think I'll ever quit magic. I love. I do love it. It is my passion. It was always my dream job. Um, you know, ever since I was a child. And and like you say, I do have 
So I've got quite, I'm really fortunate the space we've got here. We've got a really big showroom. Then out the back, I've got a really big workshop where we repair bikes as well. And then uh, we've actually got uh, the whole of upstairs and I've turned that into a studio uh, for my Zoom shows. It's all just set up and ready to go all the time. All the lights, all the backdrop up, my table's ready to go. So I literally just rock up, do a show. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's great. It's great fun. So sometimes literally... I'll put a sign on the door saying back in half an hour, go up, do a half an hour show, come down. Sometimes there's someone waiting at the door and I'm like, I'm back. You know, so, um, you know, I love it. I, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't love doing Zoom shows. I enjoy doing Zoom shows. And it is a way of keeping sort of the, my sort of interest in magic and my love of entertaining people. It gives me that spark still. Um, and I know some people are saying, oh, they'll always do Zoom shows. Once I've got the opportunity to go back to do real shows, that's where I'm going to be. I don't love them. It is a nice way of connecting with my audiences. It's a nice way of connecting with regular customers that have seen me over the years. But I'm not in love with doing Zoom shows. I hate the... Uh, the delay yeah so that wasn't for comedy effect the delay <laughs> but <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like yeah. that line yeah. then 10 seconds later you get the laugh you know like, you know that doesn't it doesn't feel right and like i say i i enjoy it but i don't love doing them but i am doing a fair few so i've got like you know four or five this week you know i, say, and, and, you know, I spoke to marvin burglass the other day who's a fairly smart cookie when it comes to business hmm. and and he turned around and he said one of the best things that magician can do in this day and age is set up multiple income streams and that's what you've done hmm. uh, the e-bikes the, e the virtual shows hmm. the live entertainment and even before that you know you had this completely separate thing with carl and then you had this completely separate thing that you did on your own and then yeah and you've always kind of had that thing where you've got like multiple pots so if one kind of struggles you've got other it's just really clever i mean you're very clever you're a clever guy oh well stop it <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not i'm not sure my teachers at school would have agreed with you on that one but uh, yeah i you know i am passionate about everything that i do it doesn't matter what i turn my head to it, i've got to be passionate about it and then i will give it my all what what i'm I guess guilty is the wrong word, but I uh, I think it's the only way I can describe it. What I'm guilty of is when I do something, I do it big. It's it's go big or go home. I don't do in the middle. You know, it doesn't matter what it is I, I turn my hand to. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, if I want a van for my business, it's got to be the best van in the world ever. It can't just be a normal box standard van. I've got to put my heart and soul into designing it, making sure the graphics look good and it, everything's color coded. And, it, and when I turn up to a gig, people go, whoa, this guy's van, you know, but that's just, you know, and maybe I spend way too much money on it that doesn't make sense, you know, from a business point of view. But, and it's the same with the, with the shop that I've done, you know, I just, I just, it's literally, it's go big or not bother. It's not even go big or go home. It's just don't bother. <laughs> Absolutely, one hundred percent. Now, let's let's just backtrack a little bit and talk about your career. Um, it feels like you've been in magic as long back as I can remember. When did? What's your origin story, Dave? When did you? Is it the traditional? I, I, you know, I got a magic set brought to me when I was like four, and it blossomed from there. Yeah, I, I'd love to tell you a different story, but <laughs> it's exactly that. Uh, my father uh, actually uh, had a shop. Uh, back in the day, uh, when I was around, I think I was around five years old, um, and he had a little kind of um, like a stationery shop, but he sold Paul Daniels magic sets, these little, I, you know, maybe they're a pound, I don't know, but they were the kind of little kits, individual tricks they were, rather than one big set. Um, and he used to bring me back them a couple of times, and I really loved them and sort of really got hooked on it and really enjoyed sort of, you know, baffling my parents. And I thought, this is really good. I quite like it. And I was always uh, very much a kind of a show off as a child, you know? So if there was a magician or there was any kind of entertainer that needed a helper, you know, I was the first to put my hand up. I was like, oh, pick, pick, pick me, you know, I, I would literally burst if I wasn't chosen. So I was always dying to get up and, and entertain. Um, so I started with the little, little magic sets and really enjoyed those. Um, so that's all thanks to to my dad bringing them home um, and then sort of became a fan of Paul Daniels, in fact, 
Um, and then my first ever show, I, be I believe I was five or six years old. We used to go on holiday to a, a place in Bournemouth, most Christmases, to a hotel called the Tralee Hotel. It's not there anymore. And they had a kind of children's play area. And that Christmas, the Christmas morning, I got a full-size Paul Daniels magic set. Um, and I've actually, I've recently found it on, on uh, eBay, the exact set that I have. So I've, I've now got that in pristine condition. And I practiced a few of the tricks, put up a little poster in the reception that afternoon saying there was a free magic show and put on a little show, uh, you know, literally only just learned some of these tricks that morning, uh, put on a little show. They paid me, I think it was a can of Coke and a packet of crisps. Um, and, and that was it. From that day onwards, I was kind of literally hooked. I never, from that day onwards, I never didn't, I never didn't. <laughs> I never not. No, I can't wait that one out. I always <laughs> had magic in my life. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And did you, did you, so, uh, so you then carried on learning more and learning more and learning more. Did you become a full-time pro after education or did you have a proper job for a time before you became full-time? So, yeah, I did have a proper job. I, um, through necessity, so I was a very young dad. Uh, I was 18 years old when my first child uh, was born. So I was quite a young daddy. Um, so I had to kind of get a real job, as it were. I'd always wanted, I was still doing shows here and there when I was 18. Um, uh, I had my first TV appearance when I was 18. I was on Michael Barrymore's My Kind of People. Uh, doing a doing a little bit of an act um, and I always had it but just I didn't I couldn't quite see how it could be a full-time career at that stage I didn't know enough oh I didn't think anyway because I was getting sort of you know 50 quid here 80 quid there and it was just bits and pieces um, I was current I was working in a hotel at the time um, and living in the hotel as well and I was doing shows for the hotel in the restaurant and they were paying me sort of 50 pounds or something like that to do little kind of close up uh, stints within the restaurant. And then I was getting other pubs and places kind of getting me little bits of work. It was just dribs and drabs, nothing major. No kids shows at all. Not this is not when I was 18. Uh, had no intention of doing family or children's shows at all. I was very, very much kind of, oh, I know I need to do close up, you know, that kind of sort of thought process. Um, and then it was, I was doing those bits, pieces, working in hotels. I was a, an estate agent for a while. I was anything sales. It was mostly all sort of sales based. Um, so when I actually, when I was in the hotel, I was actually the bellboy. Wow. Little hat, gloves on the shoulder, all the buttons. You know, I could have been in panto, really. So I was a proper full on bellboy. That's, that was when, actually, that was when I was, I was 17. That was uh, when I was 17. Um, and then I went on just to a few other sales jobs. Um, and then it was my eldest daughter's fourth birthday. And I called around a few entertainers and sort of found out, you know, how much they were charging. I was like, oh, wow, what is money? <laughs> I didn't realize I was that expensive. I thought it was going to be like 50 quid, you know, and they were, this is back in, crikey, so this is like 1990. Eight, I believe, something like that, 98. And I think they were sort of, I've called around places and they were charging sort of 80 pounds. I was like, oh, that's not bad, but I reckon I could do it better. So I decided just to do my eldest daughter's birthday party and I was Pirate Dave. Yeah, that's right, Pirate Dave. <laughs> and at the end of the party, I was absolutely shattered, like properly shattered. Um, and I just did, I did, I did a little bit of magic, but I just did games and just did run around. And everyone said to me at the end, oh my God, you were so good. You were so good. And that was when my company was born. Magic Roundabout Entertainment was born off the back of that party. I decided to then create the business. And back then in the day, so this is sort of early 2000. So it's like 1999, I think it quite properly got off its feet. Um, and I bought some bouncy castles, I bought disco equipment, and I just wanted to create this big entertainment company, um, and I did, um, and I had other magicians working for me, and I was trying to sort of be this big entertainment company, um, and it didn't work. Well, what didn't work is it needed me. That was, that was what sold it, 
Mm. And as soon as I sent somebody else out, or as soon as I did somebody else doing the things, as soon as it, to be honest with you, even if I sent someone out with the bouncy castles, you know, I'd get complaints, I'd get calls. And, but every time I did it and I was delivering it, I was getting people, oh, the guy that delivered the bouncy castle, he was wonderful and this, that, and the other. I was, yeah, because it was me, you know? So mm. I, I found out very early on that it was very difficult. And I know you run a, a, a company where you have other people and I, completely my heart goes out to you because it's it be difficult pain. it's difficult you know i always said this back in the day that the best way for me to make money personally to make a lot of money would to be invent a cloning machine because that's what i need i need another 10 of me out there doing what i do and I, i'm not saying that in a big-headed way i'm saying it in a way that it just that was the business that's what made it work was me you know and as soon as that went away from it i found it very very difficult so you know at one point uh, with magic roundabout entertainment so i had 20 i think it was either 20 or 25 bouncy castles and then i had sort of three separate sort of disco equipments um I, and i had like the rodeo ball and all this kind of stuff and you know i had about six or seven face painters and a couple of guys doing magic and you know it was it was quite big but the hassle and the the headache of it all i just at some point uh you know i just went no nah, I'm, I'm just gonna scale it all down i got rid of all the bounce castles i got rid of all the disco equipment and it just became magic dave and that was it that was it was just me it was magic dave doing the kids shows the family shows all that kind of stuff and that was it and got rid of everything else and and you very very quickly built a huge brand up for yourself and 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 one question i'm going to ask you is do you have any advice for somebody getting into magic that wants to create a brand wants to be a busy successful professional magician because i remember uh, like very early on in the day everybody would mention you uh, if we had inquiries around your area and you were like you were doing the app thing before anyone else you had the app with the game that the kids could download that was like based on your puppets in the show and 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 everything was branded and the website was branded and it was just like as somebody who's got a background in marketing a qualification in marketing I was just watching the stuff you were putting out and I'm like oh my gosh this is just amazing it really was and is oh thank you that's very kind of you um I think, you know, the, 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 the most important thing about marketing is to show your passion and to, yeah, I don't have a, a degree in marketing. I don't have any, I didn't go to university or, or even to college. You know, I came straight out of school at 16 uh, with very little GCSEs and just got on with it sort of thing. That's why I always say I just got on with it. Um, but what I am really passionate about is passion. You know, if something is worth doing, then I want to put, like I said, I want to put my heart and soul into it. Um, I actually, I would definitely give um, some credit to a good friend of mine called Paul Megram. And he sort of put on to me the fact that uh, um, a color scheme was really, really important. So when I first started, I kind of didn't really have a, my color scheme was, was a little bit kind of all over the place. And I do remember Paul sort of saying to me, because he's he's very much, um, everything that he does is everything black and yellow. He's all black and yellow. And he's not particularly corporate looking, but it's just, it, it had a theme to it. And it had a sort of, you know, a look. And I remember talking to him about it, thinking, I like that concept. I like the concept of what you're trying to bring, that everything is uniform and everything is, you know, when you think Coca-Cola, you think red. When you think of, of being Q, you think orange. You know, there's certain things that you always think of. And I wanted to get to a point where, especially with, as I say, I, I have separate entities of the business, but for Magic Dave, I wanted people to think green. I wanted them to go, anything they saw green, that they saw the van, didn't, you know, didn't have to have Magic Dave splashed all over it. The fact that it was lime green was good enough to go, oh, that's Magic Dave's van, you know, or something along those lines. So I wanted to sort of, drum that into the business um and then i just wanted to give it a corporate feel but not sort of clinical and cold corporate feel because you can go too far um i just wanted to give it a corporate sort of feel to it but in a family friendly way i think that kind of makes sense you know not too clinical um so like i say it's just 
I just wanted to be passionate about what I was producing. That was the most important thing to me. That's amazing. It really is. That's really, really good advice. And obviously, after a while, you entered and won the Family Entertainer of the Year at Blackpool. I did, yes. So uh, it's incredible. I mean, <laughs> very difficult. I mean, no, no, because the thing is, people that might not know this, you were competing. You know, you've been very successful as a as a kids entertainer and also as a close up magician. But the area of the country in which you come from have got some amazing magicians like like some absolute when you think of the best magicians and kids entertainers in the UK it's from where you are so it's not like you're competing with Bozo the Clown from like down the road you're competing with people that know what they're doing absolutely um, I mean you've only got uh, you know if you look so I'm a member of uh, the Watford Association of Magicians and you look at the member list there and uh, we've got multiple winners of, of the Children's Entertainment of the Year, Blackpool competition there, um, you know, just in that club alone. So, yeah, absolutely right. There are There is a lot of uh, competition in my area. Um, I would like to think some of the competition I've created, unfortunately, because they've seen what I'm doing. They've gone, wow, this guy's really taking it up a level. We've got to try and kind of keep up with him. And that's fine. I'm fine with that. Um, because that was the thing. I did find that when I sort of first started, um, sort of pre-2000, I looked at what everyone else was doing, not in a not in a spying kind of like, oh, I'll have a look and see what they're doing. I just, I looked at their Yellow Pages adverts, that's what it was back in the day, and I just thought, I don't like it. I, I think I can do better. And I just tried to be one level or two or th even three levels above what everyone else was doing. The one thing I was very, very sure of, I didn't want to be cheap. So I looked at everyone's prices and I went above everyone's prices so I wanted to be I think at one point I think I was the most expensive uh, in the area I may still well be I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I haven't looked for a long time now um, but you know at one point I was definitely you know one of the most expensive entertainers in the area and I was fine with that I was completely fine with it because I do remember I'm sure it's happened before but I do specifically remember back in the day you have to excuse me a second I'm just going to blow my nose sorry <laughs> got a bit of a tickle um i do remember about i do remember back in the day someone calling up and saying how much do you charge and uh i think this was probably when i was um i'd just gone over the 200 pound mark for a 45 minute show um and they went oh my god over 200 pounds for 45 minutes that's ridiculous i can get someone for 100 pounds and i went no problem at all i said please have a great party it's very very gracious i always am have a great party you know i'm sure they'll do a good job you know you know however this is what i do and this is what i would bring to it etc cetera, etc cetera. they called me up a week after the party and they said to me that they had their party with the 100 pound magician and they were fortunate enough to come to a party with me a couple of days later and they were in the audience with their child and they said to me um, that they wanted to apologize and they could see they should have gone with me and i was worth even more than what i was charging uh, you know and what i mean what how how good is that i mean that makes you go you feel like going ha ha told you so but you don't you just gracefully go that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And hopefully we'll see you another year. Um, I'm almost certain that person did book another year. I can't remember that. It's a little while ago now. But it, it was nice. Not that you need validating if you are confident in your product anyway. But it is nice to have it validated in that way. Because some people, you know, they can't afford it. And I, I do understand that, it, that, that some of, you know, some people can't afford to have the very best. And that's fine. You know, I try to offer a little something for everybody, but I don't want to go out there and do cheap, cheap. There are people that go out there and do it cheap, cheap, but maybe that's how they're comfortable doing it. I'm just, I'm not. I think I've got a certain amount of worth um, and I want to bring that excitement and energy into a person's party. Now, if I was doing that exact same party and I was only getting paid 50 quid, would I be that bothered? I don't think I would. I'd be like, oh, I won't bother with that line. I won't bother with that doing that. I won't bother doing that trick. I won't bother because my heart's not in it. You know, we're not doing this for free. If my uh, bank says I can have my house for free, and I don't have to pay the mortgage, then it's a different world. But we all have to pay bills. 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to charge a good amount of money, but I'm going to make sure I've got the best equipment. I'm bringing my A game every single time. I'm always on the top of my, you know, the way that I am, the way I never turn up. Oh, God, here we go. You know, if I'm getting good money, of course, they're going to get a good service. And I think that shows and shines through every time I work. But with all that said, it's not always about the money, but it bloody helps. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, there is, I always say this, there is more to life than money, 100%. That's where it comes back to passion as well. You know, I am incredibly passionate about certain things that I do. If someone called me up and uh, it, it's for a charity event and I could spare the time and I was, you know, it could, I could make it happen, um, I would do it, you know. I would do it because I love to share what I do, you know. Yeah. So there's always like, there's always a fine line. There's always a fine line to sort of, you know, balance and is that, with all of that said, is that why you entered the Children's Entertainer of the Year? Because without being funny, Dave, you didn't need to. You you <laughs> built up a huge reputation for yourself. You had a client. It's not like you were struggling for work and you were sitting there thinking, if somehow I can win this competition, then maybe I can actually start getting some customers through the door. You had a great reputation. People were booking you at the price that you wanted to charge why take the risk of going and entering a competition? I mean, you would, so it was the right thing to do. But what was your reasoning behind it? Well, the reasoning, my main reasoning was I was very, very new to the magician fraternity. I, I did everything on my own. I'd started up the business completely on my own. I'd quit my job. So I was working at the time for, a, I was actually a, a sales director for a company um and I sort of built up the business and I built up to a point where I was like actually I don't need to work for anybody else anymore I'm just going to do this on just quit I handed in my notice and then I was I was doing the magic full time but I literally didn't know any magicians I, I I didn't know hardly any magicians at all maybe one or two but not many I just joined a local club called Watford Watford Association of Magicians or WAM as it's affectionately known um and i put my kind of hat in the ring to join the magic circle but i didn't really know any magicians um then i went to a convention i went to an ibm my first ever ibm i think around sort of 2003 something like that and then someone mentioned about this place called blackpool uh so no so yeah so 2003 that was it and then someone said about blackpool and i went oh oh I'd like to try and see what this is all about. So I went to Blackpool in 2003, looked at this, oh my God, this convention is amazing. I was like gobsmacked. Um, and then I saw the competition. I saw the competition. I went, wow, this is, this is really, really good. I think I could do that. And uh, I literally then just sort of, I, back then you had to send a videotape in to Arthur Caston, I believe it was, and say, look, you know, this is what I do. Can I, can I get in the competition? And then they shortlist. They used to watch all the videos and then they would shortlist what they felt the best six were. Um, and then they tell you whether you're in it or not. Um, and that's it. I got a call or it might have been in a letter. I can't remember now back in the day. It might have been a letter in post. Um, and then they said, uh, yeah, we'd like to invite you. You are now the finalist uh, for the Children's Entertainment of the Year 2004. Like, brilliant. So at this point, not a lot of magicians knew who I was. I didn't know a lot of magicians. Um, I, like I said, I only just recently just joined the WAM. So a couple of people of, of Watford knew me, not many. Um, and then I did the competition. And, and then when I did that, I was actually amazed at, at, at the reaction it got. There was a couple of things that why it was quite a big reaction because I showcased a particular trick that no one had ever seen before. Um, and it was a bit of a... Wow, a bit of a whoa, what happened there sort of moment, which was really exciting. Um, so people will be very familiar now uh, with the Axtel drawing board, you know? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Drawing board. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of like a standard prop for most magicians. And I'd saw, I saw it, I loved it, I used it. And then I started chatting with the inventor of it. And I said, I've got this uh, competition coming up. And he said to me, he's working on an idea to make it remote controlled so that you can step away. And I said, 
I want to do that. <laughs> and he said, well, it's no way it's going to be ready in time. And I said, I don't care. Let's do it. Let's make this happen. So I was hounding him and talking to him and, you know, sort of doing all these things. Um, and anyway, I got, I actually got the prototype before he'd even released it. I begged and sort of said, look, give me, give me, give me. And he let me have the prototype. I paid for it. He didn't let me have it. I had to pay for it. Quite a lot of money, actually, as well. Um, but he, he sold me the prototype, the final working prototype. And I, I did it at Blackpool, performed it at Blackpool. And I performed it in Blackpool knowing that it was going to be a bit of a magician's gag. And I had it up on the stage. I was holding it, doing all the moves and making it talk, etc. And then I put it down. I said, do you want to say goodbye? No, didn't think so. And everyone laughed, of course. And then it started speaking and everyone went, what, what, what? <laughs> it's just, it was really funny. I do remember at the time thinking, I've got them now. <laughs> I've got them now. Um, and also in my act, I did a levitation. I did the ventriloquism as well. I did, I just did a nice sort of mix of stuff. And what I was really sort of blown away with, it was the reaction from everybody, but also everyone going, oh my God, we, we haven't seen that style of children's entertainment before. I.e., what I thought my style were doing was... the same thing back then, weren't they? They were doing hippity hoppity rabbits. Yeah, and that's it. Bag and yeah. That's it. What I think, because my style was always been, and will always be, I want to entertain everybody, not just the children. So my style has always been family entertainment. If I can make a four-year-old laugh and a 44-year-old laugh... That's my winning combination. I want it to be exactly as everyone in the room is entertained. And that was always my ethos when I went to Blackpool as well. And I think that's what kind of won it over a bit for people that had never seen me before. And they just sort of thought, wow, who's this guy? And it did. From that on, it was a turning point for me because people just kind of went, who's this guy? You know? Well, it's true. I, was in, I, I interviewed a little while ago uh, Russ Brown obviously, you know, Russ Brown, and he said at the end of the day, he's somebody else who does a show that's not, and he said at the end of the day, it's not the kids that are booking you, it's the adults. If you can entertain yep. the adults, yep. they enjoy the show just as much as the kids. Absolutely. They're wanting to book you. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, like, what your, your initial question was, what, why do I risk it? I didn't know there was any risk because I just went along and went, oh, that looks good fun. I'll have a go at that. <laughs> on the scene, man. That's when everybody knew who Dave Allen was. And I remember for a time, I don't know if you still do this. I know you lecture, but yeah. I know for a time you had your own sort of props that you bought out. I remember, I've got one, the, the red lorry, uh, yellow lorry, which is yep. a fantastic kid's prop. I, yep. it, I do it. It's over there. <laughs> um, you're not, that's not a focus of your, yours anymore, is it? So it's kind of the, the creative. Still, it still is. So again, I, you know, uh, so after, after I won Blackpool, like I say, I kind of like suddenly people went, oh, who's this guy? I got then approached by uh, a, a really lovely, lovely guy, very, very sorely missed, who passed away a number of years ago, uh, Jeremy, who used to run Practical Magic. Um, he approached me after, literally days after Blackpool and said, um, you know, I didn't see it, but all I heard was, who's this guy? You know, he's, he's fantastic. Would I, would I lecture at his convention? He had a convention called Kidology. Um, and I said, I don't have a lecture. I said, I'll just do what I do. He says, no, you've got a lecture because, you know, whatever you're doing, just tell, tell them what you're doing. That's your lecture. And I said, OK, fine. No problem at all. So I literally put it together for this convention called Kidology in 2005. That was my first ever lecture. And again, sort of people went, you know, they really enjoyed it. They really enjoyed what I had to say. Um, and off the back of that, I kind of started to invent a couple of things so I could sell because someone gave me a piece of advice was, you know, if you can do a lecture, make sure you've got something to sell because that's where you can make some really nice money. And I like making money. So I thought, yeah, let's do it. So I come up with a few little routines that were all original of mine and then just put little, little twists to old routines and sort of made up props. And it just kind of that love affair just started from there. And every time I come up with an idea, I, you know, see if I can make it or manufacture it. I mean, the red lorry, yellow lorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'll ever do that again because that was tremendously hard work um, because that was proper manufacturing. That wasn't just, you know, some things you kind of get, you make, you put a little hole in and you put it in a bag and that's your prop done. But red lorry, yellow lorry, I really wanted to make something that was what I call Apple-esque. 
I wanted a really nice presentation box. I wanted it to look and feel really high quality. And, and it was tremendously hard work because I was dealing with a an actual manufacturer. There was things that went wrong and we had, I literally had uh, seconds of these. I was like, that's not good enough. And I had to pay for all these things, you know, a, a whole entire run that didn't work. I had to pay for, and we had to start again. And it was just, it was, it was hard work. Um, so if you've got a red lorry, yellow lorry, you know, you never know. One day that could be worth a lot of money because it's yeah. never happening again. I'm never doing it again. Man, yeah, it's, yeah, it's never hard work. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. So, and and obviously, while we're talking about Magic Roundabout and we're talking about Magic Dave, but while this is going on, you're also a very successful and busy close-up magician um doing uh under the banner of uh dave allen um which you've decided to keep those two separate which totally makes sense and i get that and that's why i keep everything separate as well but i want people to understand that watching this interview it's not just that uh your kids and a family entertainer you were just as busy doing the close-up stuff as well and you had two completely different separate branches to your business yeah i mean absolutely so dave, dave allen obviously which is my real name um it's not a made-up name. It's not my stage name. My real name is Dave Allen or David if I'm in trouble with my mother. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Dave Allen, the close-up magic. I love close-up magic. love performing close-up magic. Um, and also Dave Allen does the cabaret as well. So he does the cabaret stage magic. Um, so I was really enjoying doing that. I had a residency for a number of years, a few different residencies, actually, um, and weddings and usual stuff, you know, nothing, nothing outrageous. Again, I decided to do a couple of little competitions with um, the close-up, which I, I won, a couple of little bits and pieces. Um, I enjoyed it, but my heart was always on stage rather than the close-up when it came to Dave Allen. Um, and so I then started to do a cabaret act at Holiday Parks, which I enjoyed the show, but absolutely loathed the loneliness of the travel to the venues and hanging around backstage on my own and I just didn't really enjoy it um it, it wasn't for me um and my best friend who's Carl Charlesworth used to accompany me to the shows and used to be kind of backstage and help me out with props and bits and pieces um and that kind of helped with the idea of us doing something together because we enjoy, I enjoyed it much much more when i was on stage uh, knowing my mate was backstage helping me out and and that is the next step of your journey that's when carl and dave burst onto the scene and you've been busy ever since the formation of that double act i mean you've been very very busy i remember the first time i saw you guys was at the ibm convention yeah when i was competing in the close-up and yep. you guys were were doing the stage competition and I have never, and I'll say this on record, I told you this at the time, you filmed it, I'm sure you did. I have, I I never did yes, seen, I've got the video yeah, of you. <laughs> up until that point, I had never seen an act quite like it because it was an illusion act. And obviously, as you know, I do illusions now, but back then I didn't. And it was an illusion act where it didn't seem pompous because most illusion acts were like this sort of thing. They were trying to be David Copperfield or something. It was an illusion act that didn't take themselves seriously, that didn't have a girl that went in the boxes. It was funny. I mean, really proper funny. And each illusion, because normally when you do an illusion, it's like spin a box, put a girl in, take the girl out, end of illusion. You were doing stuff like so far. I'll, I'll, I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. You were doing the thing where... Um, uh, the, the, the day that Carl was at the front trying to do a rising card and you were sitting on a stool and you were going up and I'm like, bloody hell, this is so clever. <laughs> and, then, and then it was the, the Umbrellas of Doom, which fooled the absolute crap out of me. When that switch happened and you were in that pink leotard, I'd never been so fooled in my life. I was just like, how did that happen? The whole, the shower curtain, the... Um, a lot yep. of this stuff, you've retired now and you've moved on to different stuff, but I'm yeah. describing your original routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that assistance yeah. revenge presentation, if I had that presentation in my Illusion Act, I would never retire that piece because it is so funny with the whole... Car and, and then there's the character of you and Carl 
together the chemistry oh my god i'm coming across like a fanboy now but i, don't, <laughs> I mean you know i'm a massive fan of you and carl together on stage and that act blew me away it oh, it's very cool. i seem to i'm sure i've got a video of you craig saying that if we didn't win the ibm that year that you would get up on stage with no clothes on or sank along those lines i'm sure yeah. you like that. I'm so glad you won the comedy award because that was my yeah favorite. yeah we didn't win the whole thing but we won the comedy award yeah <laughs> uh, no that was it so Carl and Dave the way Carl and Dave come out so me and Carl were already best mates we we're really really close um, and we used to spend a lot of time with each other and we used to go to Wham together and things like that Carl actually got asked to do something for Wham um, so Wham is on a Tuesday night Tuesday morning he comes around my house like he normally did just sort of hanging out and chatting. Uh, and he went, oh, I've got to do something for Wham tonight um, for the stage. And I went, oh, well, what have you got to do? And he said, oh, I've got to do Dangerous Trick. And I went, oh, really? And, he said, and I said, should we do something together? And he's like, oh, yeah, well, that takes the pressure off me. Yeah, let's do something together. And that was how the Box of Doom was born. From And that morning, we come up with an idea. I, I had a prop called uh, the Phoenix. Um, and it was a, a kind of... A, a, it was a flight case and you used to put these sort of fire poles through them and then the person inside was completely safe and they would come out unharmed so i had that prop just sitting in my garage so look that's quite dangerous let's do that and then we just literally we sat down sort of you know chatting about it and coming up with ideas and gags and bits and pieces and um and that's basically that was how box of doom was born that was the kind of i still got a video of it somewhere I might even be on YouTube somewhere. Um, and we did it at, at Wham that night. And people were just like, oh, my God, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Because I think what we did was we decided to do a costume change in there. So Carl went in there. I put all the fire things in there. He then set off a little smoke machine. There's smoke coming out of the box, even though you think he's all right. I'm like wafting all this smoke. Then he, I open it up. And when he comes out, all his clothes will burn. And he's like burnt to cinders. That was kind of the gag of it. Um, and he's got, and he's, got, he's got soot all over his face and he's literally he's got, and but we did a few of the little gags in there that we've got still in the original box doom that we've got now and everyone's like oh it's amazing we loved it we loved it um you should do that more and we sort of went yeah let's do it more um and and that was it that was the kind of that was the start of it and we started to put stuff together um and that was how it was all sort of born from that moment Wow. And, and ever since then, you've been innovating new routines and new ideas. Yeah. Uh, I've gone on record on this channel as saying that your version of the heads up or the three bucket Monty, All right. you want to call it, yeah. the funniest routine of that type. Like, it's just hilarious. And I think it's down to characterization. Like, for those of you that haven't seen Carl and Dave, um, Carl plays a very camp um very which he's not he's i mean you know he's, he's, he plays a very camp uh guy that's that's always trying to be the center of attention yeah. and you're trying to be the serious straight yeah. man yeah obviously pissed off with carl yeah that's um, that is a very good point i am so we're both very much out of character actually you say Carl's not that camp in real life. He is pretty camp. Let's let's be. I'm going to go on the record here. And he'll, he'll agree with me. He's quite camp. Um, but what I am in our character is I'm very angry with with Carl for most of the time, and that works for us. Um, but you know that is something that I am not normally. I'm, I'm very easygoing. <laughs> but in our acts, you know, that is you've got it. You've got it on the. You hit the nail on the head. He's trying to be centre of attention. And I'm just trying to be a really good magician in front of all these people. You know, we've got a, a a new part in our act that we tried out a little bit when the lockdown, sort of that little gap of lockdown we had last year. Um, and we were trying out a new routine where I was doing a very suave mind reading routine. And then in the middle of it, Carl comes in and does a live TikTok, you know, lit and he does it for real. He's literally on TikTok live in the middle of our act and he's showing everybody and he's doing a tiktok dance while i'm trying to do mind reading and and it works i'm shouting my head up, will you you know stop this we're in a live act here and it, it just it works that's our character sort of uh it, the characters work and bounce off each other and i think it works because we're we're good good friends and if you had to give any advice for anybody watching this on developing a character for stand -up, 
what advice would you give somebody? Because you're, you, like you said, you aren't that person. You aren't that person that's angry at Carl 24-7, but you wouldn't believe it watching you. You play it so well. So a lot of newer magicians struggle with finding that character on stage. Have you got any advice on, on kind of doing that? I think my best advice uh, would be, you know, doing it and doing it and doing it, getting as much stage time as possible, especially if you can do a run. You know, I would say getting a run of shows is so important. You know, even if you have to do it for a little bit less money, you know, if you can do, when me and Carl did the Fringe uh, in Edinburgh, oh boy, did our, did our act change. You know, when we did that run of, of 15 shows in a row, it was so good to be able to go, right, let's move that here. Let's do this. Let's try it in this way. Let's try doing this line in this way. You know, there's things like that. I mean, that's crazy how a, how a line can completely change by just moving a couple of things around. I always say this to, to Carl, the amount of times that we do it, we go, that didn't work tonight. So when we do this tomorrow, let's try saying it this way. And, you know, or let's move that gag to this part. It, it It's honestly, it's... It's so incredible. I'd love to know the psychology of it, but it's incredible what a difference just little changes can make. And you can only do these little changes if you are constantly working. So getting a run of the shows, no matter how you do it, you know, if you're doing them for a little bit less money or you're fortunate enough to do something like the Fringe or anything like that, it's amazing what you can do. And, and then you can develop and change and you know, start off with, you could be starting off with being a completely straight magician, mind reader, doing no gags to all the way to a, a Tommy Cooper-esque. You, you'd be surprised what you can achieve, you know, in, in a run of shows. So my biggest advice is just work, work, work. Just just perform, 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 perform. There's no, there is no substitution for it. Brilliant advice. And one more question on that subject. Ha have you got any advice on how to make a prop your own? Because one thing that I've seen you do personally, but also I've seen it in Carl and Dave's show, which is you take existing props and completely turn them on their head. Look at the Assistant's Revenge. Look at the Three Bucket Monty. Look at every single routine that you do. It's not. It's almost unrecognizable from the way that every other magician does it. How do you go through that process of looking at a prop and going, right, I'm going to make this my own? This sounds really obvious, but I don't know whether it is or not. I tend to look at something and think, that's good. How can I make it entertaining? <laughs> if that makes sense? Because sometimes, so look, okay, Assistance Revenge is a really good example, okay? Yeah. Assistance Revenge um, is, the plot is very simple. The magician gets trapped in something. The assistant then turns the curtain and then, you know, they switch places, all right? Okay, or sort of vice versa, sorry. The assistant is is trapped, the magician pulls the curtain, and then when they come across, the magician's now trapped. But that's it. It's not really, in my opinion, that entertaining. So what, when we looked at that as a prop, I thought it's quite a nice illusion, but it's not entertaining. It's not for Carl and Dave, it's not entertaining enough. For, for an illusion act, they'd quickly just get that out, that'd be a five-second routine, boom, 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 done, let's walk away. So I look at that and I, and I will analyze it and I say, okay, right, what can I do to make this funny? What can I do to uh, get Carl in a different costume half the time is what I'm thinking. Because <laughs> that's normally always quite a good fun thing to do. Um, you know, or what can I do that completely jars with somebody that go, ah, of course. So when I looked at the assistant's revenge, I looked at it and I went, well, it looks like a, it looks like a shower. It looks like a shower. So, of course, I'm going to turn that into a shower routine now. So when the curtain comes around the first time, no, the first thing we did was um, we, we turned the curtain and Carl's upside down in it. So I whipped the curtain around. So it's basically, it's going wrong. It's not, it's not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So I whipped the curtain back. Then he goes, oh, I can't get out. Open it again. He's upside down. Um, then I whip it back again. And then a, a, a shower sound effects comes on. I'm like, what's going on now? I whip it out again. He's now standing there in his trunks and a shower cap. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got soap suds going and everything, you know? And it was like, because it looks like a shower. Uh, mm. And then that's, uh, at that point is the only point when then the illusion happens. So the preamble of that is a good six-minute routine before we get to the, 
four second illusion of what it is. And that only reason that come about is because I look at it and go, it just isn't entertaining enough. We want to be, but our act is fun and funny. Um, so, you know, that's what it had to be. Similar with the, with the three Monty uh, bucket routine, you know, although that is slightly more entertaining on its own anyway, but for us, again, we just wanted to add extra layers to it to make it even more entertaining. Um, and with that one, it was a bit more about speed as well and a few other bits and pieces. But um, so basically, I, I will get inspired by an illusion, by the actual trick, as it were. I'll look at that and go, I like that. I think we could do it better. That's, that's all. I'm not talking about someone else is doing it. I'm just looking at the actual prop and I'll look at it and go, that's got potential for so much more comedy. And the focus for me is purely comedy. You know, that's what I look at. I won't, I will very rarely look at uh, uh, the magic aspect of it until the very end. That kind of comes second part. So we've got a really good levitation in our act. And it is a really strong levitation where I self levitate. But the, the best part of that routine is Carl pretending to levitate by standing on a stepladder you know and he's literally standing on a stepladder he's got this cloth in front of him and then and, and the cloth accidentally drops down you know that's the best part for me in that routine and then as it drops down i then start floating up in the background it's like what hang about there's the magic element so for me you know the comedy comes first the magic comes second brilliant absolutely brilliant now, in recent years, you've also formed a show with your son, right? Yes. And you entered Blackpool yes. with that act. Yes. I mean, <laughs> as if you're not busy enough. I mean, this is obviously pre-COVID. You've, yeah. you've got Carl and Dave, you're running around the country doing that. You've got Dave Allen, you've got the magic yeah. one that you are, you are incredibly busy. So what do you think? I oh, know, let's put a completely another act out. Let's go and do something else. <laughs> let's go. And it was it was completely different to Carl and Dave. When I saw it, I was like, that is so completely different. I suppose I've got two questions. What yes. made you decide to put that act together? Did Carl feel like you were trading him in for a younger model? <laughs> <laughs> and is that something that you're planning? Does it have legs, this act? Is it something you're going to carry on doing? Okay, so I'll answer the first part of that question was why do we do it? So the, the reason why we did it is because, um, you know, I love spending time, quality time with my son. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, my children don't, well, actually one of my children, I have five children now because I've got a new little baby. Um, but my other four children, two of them are all grown up, they live away. And my other two children live with my ex-wife. So I don't get to see them as much as I would like. And my son has really got into magic. So he, he is uh, 13 years old. Uh, he's really been getting into magic. And he was coming with me to Magic Dave shows. And he became kind of like my warm-up guy. It was really, really good. He would literally go on, onto the stage first, do a few tricks. And he's done shows in holiday parks with me and all sorts. And great stage presence. Yeah, he has. He really has. And, he, and, and again, I've always... I've infused that into him that it's again it's it's more about the 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 performance rather than the trick you know so I've really kind of said to him you know you can go so far by your style and and what you're doing rather than what the trick is you're doing so he's he's built up quite a good sort of uh, stage presence and you know he's he's really confident so he was doing bits and pieces on his own before I came on stage and then uh, we sort of chatted about perhaps doing a double act together. Um, and then the Blackpool Heats were coming up, uh, which were held in Watford. Not Nothing to do with Wham. It just so happens to be run by uh, the organ one of the organisers from Wham. But it's the Blackpool Heats where you go into the competition and then the winner of that competition then goes on to Blackpool because obviously they've changed the way that they, they run it. So we decided to come up with an act. And we worked together and we worked hard. You know, we would hire, again, it's, it's these things like it's go big or go home. So any, any other person would probably do an act, come up with a few little things and, and do it in the lounge. Mm, no, no, not us. I was hiring halls. I was hiring in props, you know, big illusions. And we were doing, you know, big stuff because we wanted it to be for Blackpool. Blackpool's a big stage. Um, so I was designing the act with Jacob's help and he had lots of input 
uh, for Blackpool. Um, we did the heats. Uh, we uh, we won the heats, which was fantastic. Unfortunately, we didn't win Blackpool. Uh, I like to think we came second. I don't know. They don't really do a second. So, uh, but um, Graham Shaw had a fantastic gap that year, uh, which was very funny. And unfortunately, we didn't win. But it didn't. We weren't too upset because we did what we wanted to do. It was phenomenal. Was, it was yeah so to good. perform on that big stage uh, and make a right r- ruddy great mess because we had these confetti cannons go off and uh, it was an enormous, an enormous mess of confetti and streamers everywhere, um, uh, which we got in a little bit of trouble for because <laughs> straight after us. Um, there was supposed to be uh, rehearsals on the stage and they were spending ages clearing up all this confetti and I got a little bit of a telling off going, well, what did you do that for? I was like, well, go big, go, go big. Um, so that was with thanks to uh, another friend of mine, Jezzo, who helped out with uh, with the um, pyrotechnics, as it were. So that was really, really good. Jezzo Bond. Um, but yeah, so we, we just, we wanted to have some fun and we, we had a great time. And sometimes we were rehearsing until, you know, gone midnight and, you know, my boy loved doing that as well. And um, is there legs for it? I think there is. I think we'll do more of it when real shows come back. We did get booked. We did get a booking. We got a booking. We did, uh, we did our local magic clubs, what they call fish and chip supper. So we actually got booked as an act for it. And we really enjoyed doing that as well. Um, your second part of that question was did Carl get upset luckily Carl is a very laid back guy <laughs> anybody else would definitely get their nose pet out joint going oh my god I'm getting replaced <laughs> but not Carl he's he's pretty relaxed and he's like yeah fair, fine <laughs> no problem at all that's awesome Plus you got but I was very I was very um very sure of, of the fact that I wanted to be completely different to Carl and Dave. So again, my character changed again yeah. to suit that act. So I wasn't the same Dave from Carl and Dave. So we call ourselves D and J magic. So it is more of the father son relationship rather than anything else. So I was very strict that I wanted to make it completely different from Carl and Dave. Oh, you definitely achieved that. Yeah. Now I want to talk to you about a couple of other things very quickly, but before we do, there's yep. one thing I want to ask you. You have been, you've had such a successful career. Like you have never, ever struggled for work, ever. And, and you've always had multi facets of your business. And I asked why you did the, uh, the, the, the various competitions you entered and you said, because you didn't know better and that's fair enough. Britain's got talent. <laughs> let's just bring it up. Let's just, let's just, let's just bring it up. Get out. <laughs> and he's gone. <laughs> Because obviously you didn't need to enter it. You were nope. successful without it. Yeah. It didn't go brilliantly. Could have gone better. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, yeah, like obviously, I mean, you've completely uh, how you've dealt with that whole thing is just brilliant. Like you completely owned it, which is awesome. I think I would have just quit magic if I'd had even half of what happened to you happened to me. I would have just quit there and then. <laughs> but you. I mean, it's just a testament to your character to see how you dealt with that whole thing. Is there any light you can shine on that as to why? I mean, I've been very open with people uh, about this. I haven't got a problem about talking about it. Uh, So Britain's Got Talent, people seem to forget how long ago it was. So this was season one. No one knew about Britain's Got Talent. So I just saw the... And it was back when they hated magicians. Exactly, yeah. So they all hated magicians. They, they had no love of magic at all. There was no real structure. No one really knew how, how it was going. But also, they were trying to be shock TV back then as well. So they were, they were kind of willing acts to, to not be very good. And they were editing acts in a way that was completely unprofessional. Um, so I've just noticed my lights have, have gone off. That, they're on a timer. <laughs> That means we've been going on hopefully not too long. Um, so, yeah, it's um, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. I saw there was a talent show. I saw there was a big prize. I had an act at the time that was doing really, really well. So this is pre Carl and Dave days. This is back when I was just doing Dave Allen's cabarets. And I come up with this act, a competition piece, purely that. Uh, that I was doing uh, with uh, with a duck, 
I'd, I'd entered it into the IBM. I'd won the comedy in the IBM. I put it into um, a show at Blackpool was called the All Winners Show at Blackpool Magic Convention back then. So it wasn't a competition. They invited winners of Children's Entertainment of the Year competition to perform at this kind of on this one stage at, at Blackpool. I performed it there. And again, people were just raving about it. They absolutely loved it. And I liked it. It was a great little act. Um, and so Britain's Got Talent turned up on my radar and I went, hey, I've got an act. It's all ready to go. Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's go for it. So obviously didn't know anything about it at the time. Um, now, there is no proof, but I have had it told me that I was purposely sabotaged. My act was sabotaged to make good TV. Simple as that. Um, whether it's true or not, I don't know. I can't prove it. But it is it is strange that, you know, I'd performed at this point, I'd performed this act, I would say, mm, certainly over 20 times on stage. And it never gone wrong. Never, ever. Um, and then when I came around to doing it on this stage, for those of you who don't know, look on YouTube. It's still there. It's got millions of views. Um, I think if you put duck fail magic or something like that, it comes up. Basically, duck, it's, it can talk, you know, with a, some pretty poor ventriloquism, but I don't claim to be the best ventriloquist in the world. So duck, I make a duck appear out of a pad like the bowling ball type scenario. Then it talks. Then I put it in a cannon fire it across the stage and it ends up in a cage across the other side and the gag is that it's a different duck anyway it's a comedy act because when i pick up the duck from the other side i say good night i say say good night domino and then the duck goes i'm not domino you know so it's it's a gag but it worked it was a funny gag yeah so you know i was never trying to be the biggest illusionist in the world it was always comedy based and you know like i say it worked it was an act that worked um, and then when I went to go and do it, Brits Got Talent, they left us hanging around for, I think it was six plus hours. I was tired. The ducks, two of them, were tired. Um, and then they said to me, you can't set your stuff on a stage. We have to set it. And I was like, no, I, I've got to set my stuff. You know, it's, it's more technical than a, putting a microphone for a singer. I have to set my own stuff. And they said, no, you can't. We've got to set it. Tell us where you want it. So they did, and what I believe that they did was um, they opened the door that was that was shut. So there's a door that uh, you you that can open and shut where the duck could get out. It's how you get him out, basically. This system is how I would get him out after the trick is done. So normally it's shut, and uh, I believe, and obviously you know, obviously at the time, drilling is going that they opened this door. So when the duck went in, he could immediately get out. So basically, premise is I put the duck in the cannon, it fires across stage, all the pyrotechnics work perfectly. But because they've opened this door, he then goes, when the pyrotechnics goes off, he goes, oh, I don't like that, I'm off. And he jumps out. And now I've got two ducks on the stage at the same time, which you don't normally have. I still, you know, I would still do the gag with one duck. So I then go, oh, live audience, I was at the Palladium, I believe it was, live audience, I go, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm kind of doing this. I'm a scientist. That's my persona. I've got a white coat on, goggles and all that. Kind of mad Duck scientist. Duck to the future and all that, yeah. It's... Duck to the future, exactly. Yeah, my love of Back to the Future. So I say, ladies and gentlemen, I have cloned the ducks. So I thought on my feet, covered it. Audience loved it. You know, they were they were clapping and cheering because it, it was a comedy act. The, the judges, you know, oh, I hated that. A man was like, oh, that poor duck, you know, this, that and the other. Um, and obviously they all said no, fair, fair enough. But what was annoying about that was that they edited in people booing me. I never, bad. ever got a single boo. You know, I, I never got a single boo. But they edited in people going, boo, get off, get up, boo. And that, that never happened. And that was the thing that really kind of, it got to me because it, it sort of, you know, I was like, actually on that day, I completely covered me. I, I put on a show that everyone in that theatre enjoyed. And I was, although I was a bit paid, you know, that it happened, is the other thing. The other thing they did was quite underhand was, so obviously I had these two ducks and then the judges want to speak to me. So I, I got the two ducks and I put them sort of backstage and I 
said to the guy, just put them away or something like that, you know. But they, they uh, my mic wasn't live audibly, but they still could pick it up. So they took that pickup of me saying to the guy, go on, put them away, put them away, put them away, and added that into the edit as well. So they were very underhand. I mean, there's it's no really true way about it. They were underhand and they, uh, did it hurt my career? No. Not, not at all. Ask. Not at all. Not even slight. Did I get ribbed by magicians for years after? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Always quacking at me. And doing... But that's fine. Water off a duck's back. You see, uh, that yeah. is literally, literally. Um, no, absolutely didn't hurt my career at all. Uh, in fact, I got a gig out of it, a couple of gigs. I got a, a gig on the Discovery Channel off the bat of it. Um, so the Discovery Channel, they saw it and they wanted to do a piece on magicians with odd, uh, you know, a, a piece on people with odd pets. Um, and they did a piece about the ducks. And I, I made sure this time I said, is it going to, are you going to put me in a bad light? And they, no. And I had final edit on it and I could see it before it went out. I was like, cool. Um, so that was really nice. I had a couple of bookings off the back of it, you know, literally straight off the back of it. And it, you know, like I say, it's on YouTube. It's had millions, millions and millions of hits. But if you look down the comments every now and again, you'll see someone say, I've seen this guy's act firsthand it's amazing they've they haven't portrayed it well or this guy's really good at what he does this is this was a shame and things like that um so I, like i say it was unfortunate um and whenever anybody says to me you know would you do britain's got talent i would always say no however i would change my mind with regards to if you were having russ stevens behind you because I know Russ gets quality performers on Brett's Got Talent. So if you have him in your corner, yeah. then I think it's a different story. And I do think they change their ways. I do think yeah. they change their ways. Because um, I think it's a completely different animal from series one to what we're at now. Yeah. I think it's completely different. I think they have to, you know, with all of the bad press that TV shows have had with bullying people. Yeah. I think they've had to go in completely the other direction and it shows with how they're portraying the acts now. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you ever go back on again? If Russ Stevens had your back, would you ever go on again with your son or with Carl or on your own or is that ship completely sailed? Um, I would never say never. I don't know whether I would or I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't. I would... I think yes, I probably would. Is it like you know I say? If I, I had, they'd make a big deal of it. Yeah, show the footage of you from season one. Yeah, and it'd be this whole redemption story. I reckon if you went on, gosh, sort of I, would say I had blonde wrong. spiky hair, blonde know. spiky hair, no beard. I was completely different. I was in my twenties, you know. So, um, so I think short answer, yeah, I think I probably would actually. I probably would do it if I had the right. If I felt I had the right act, if I felt that it was the right move and as i say if i knew i had russ in my corner then yes i would but it, i would never do it on my own i would never just queue up like they do you know i would never do any of that because that's what i did back in the day i queued up with the rest of the people you know in the big queue with a big cannon you know <laughs> and stuff like that it was it was ridiculous that i did it all and i just did it all myself i was very naive you know and i and back then as well so you perform it in front of a panel of a few people and then they say yep you're good enough to go to the live auditions and then you go to the live auditions and there's a whole process you know so when you get to that on stage you've had to have done a load of other things before that so I went through that whole official way um, and you know if you've got someone in your corner you don't have to do all that rubbish you know because they know you're a quality act so I think the short answer I probably would I don't have any intentions to at the moment but I probably would yeah. Never say never. Never now, say never. No, no, no. Never say never. Now, I know that we're going to have to rip this up in a few minutes because you're very busy <laughs> and you've got Zoom shows to go. I've got some <laughs> left to ask and then that's it. So okay. the first one is, I'd like to mention the Magic Circle. Um, yes. Of course, obviously, that's something that you've embraced recently because, yep. hey, it's not like you're busy or anything. Why not yeah. throw something else that's going to take up all of your time? So, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you know, new baby, new business. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's just chuck the magic circle in there as well. Why not? Um, <laughs> and so, so you're on the council of the magic circle, and uh, which which is which is absolutely fantastic. And you know, over lockdown with the whole unlocked stuff that's been going on, the Tommy Cooper one and the uh, the first one, and then the Soaring and Half. Yep. Circle's been getting some really great press, and I think it's been attracting a lot of new members. Um, any advice for? people that might want to consider joining as a council member. I spoke to Noel uh, and he said now is the best time to join because you don't have to actually do an audition in person. It's so much easier auditioning <laughs> now than it is auditioning, you know, in normally when things are back to normal. I, I just thought as you're on the council, uh, any advice for people that might be considering joining? Okay, well, my advice is absolutely join. So it was a dream of mine to join the Magic Circle. Um, it was... Obviously, it was this kind of unknown thing, the magic circle. Oh, this is an interesting sort of place. You know, when I first started in magic and I had the Paul Daniels magic kit, and I was like, oh, what's this amazing place? And it was really nice because it came full circle. I did meet Paul a few times, um, and, and Paul actually, and I still keep it on there because I think it's a good recommendation. Paul actually recommended me um, for children's birthday parties because he saw my work. And he actually said he endorsed me. So it kind of came full circle. And I met him, my first time I met him was at the Magic Circle. Um, and incidentally as well, the, the, I, um, I didn't audition for the Magic Circle. So this is back in the day where you were joined as an a, as a associate when they first started. And then you were supposed to do an audition. And then because I won Blackpool, they just went to me, oh, you don't, you don't have to do the audition. <laughs> You've just won Blackpool. Um, we'd love to have you as a full member. I love the Magic Circle. I took over as the manager of the theatre a couple of years ago as well, because I was very passionate about everything that was putting on there. Um, unfortunately, I've had to step down from that role just because I have got too much uh, on and I want to, it needs a lot of attention. That needed a lot of my time. And I spent a lot of time there. Like, you know, when, with, with people at the Magic Circle, what you, what you have to understand is that every single person is a volunteer. We're all doing it because we love magic and we love magical, the magical arts. Um, being a member of council is, is a lot of hard work as well, but I, we are all very, very passionate about it. My advice is if you can join, because it's not that easy and, and quite rightly so it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be able to just call, I want to be a member, you know, because I've got a packet, a packet of cards for Christmas, you know. We want to have a prestigious magic club. And I think that's every right to have that. Um, but we also want you to nurture people that are have a genuine interest in magic. So if you get the opportunity to join the magic circle, absolutely grab it with both hands because it is not only a magical building, and I, and I absolutely love and adore the magic circle headquarters, um, but it is a, a, a fabulous organisation. And I think we've got a really, really bright future, a really bright future. Unfortunately, we're closed, like lots of places are, but there's big plans for the future and, and uh, you know, loads more live shows uh, that uh, our president, um, Noel Britton, was trying to do before, obviously, COVID hit and comedy nights and all sorts of uh there was going to be a fringe we were going to hold a fringe for the camden fringe uh, there was all sorts of a halloween special there was you know there's so many exciting things going on there not to mention you know the library the museum you know it is a fabulous fabulous organization and, and uh yeah my advice is if you can join please do great advice absolutely fantastic advice so my final question is oh, what final question. final question uh what's next because you've had a career that most people would dream of if you decided to go you know what i'm giving up on this magic stuff i'm going to uh, i'm going to i'm going to go full time with the bike shop nobody would nobody would blame you and you would have oh i am full time with the bike shop i know right <laughs> <laughs> But, but you know, you know as well as me, when, when live entertainment comes back, it's going to come back hard and it's going to be busier forever than ever because there's going to be so many magicians that have decided to call it a day. I was speaking to Ross Brown about this and he's like, so many of his friends have just quit and, and, and you see it happening all over. So there's yeah. going to be a big demand for entertainment and there's less magicians and entertainers to go around. So it's going to come back and it's going to come back big. My question is... Is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't done yet? 
Are you still wanting to be, I mean, you've talked about how you want the bike shop to be some almost like a passive income stream where you can pay somebody to run it, but you don't want it to affect what you're doing as a, as a performer. Is there anything you, you want to do as a performer that you haven't done, or is it just more of the same because you love what you do? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, absolutely. I, I, I am the, the, the bike shop is, is I'm going to be able to run it and do it. You know, let's face it as, as a, as a full-time magician, you, you, you've got a lot of bit, you've got a bit of time. All right. Let's, let, let, let's be honest with each other. Cause that's what I, I definitely, I definitely know is that as a full-time magician, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, that's your busy days. The rest of the week, what are you doing? You know, it is as simple as that. I know it's not quite that uh, easy, especially for myself, because I'm always doing things and building websites and doing bits and pieces, very much like yourself. You're running a business, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, you've got time in your hands. Um, so when when the magic does come back, and it will come back, I am hundreds of, I mean, you know, the bookings are already starting to come back in for after the restrictions have ended. Um, what I'm hoping is that the Carl and Dave tour will get back on the road. So like I say, last year we had, you know, a decent sized tour in the bag. It was because we uh, appeared on Cracker Jack season one of the new kind of reinvention of Cracker Jack. Which people got, need to check out on YouTube, by the way, because it was hilarious. I'll it's on our the iPlayer as well. Uh, it's on the BBC iPlayer. So we've actually done season one and we've done season two now. So we were only one of about three acts they invited back for season two. So off the back of that now, we're hoping that uh, we're getting a bit of a following from, you know, from holiday parts. We'll see that because they love all that kind of as seen on TV stuff. I would definitely love, uh, we love doing the holiday part. So I would love to get back to that. As far as aspiration, uh, as Aspiration, no, edit that out. As far as, <laughs> I can't think of the word. As far as what I would like to do in the future, I would love, I would love to do something in Vegas. Even if it was just like a, a small run. I love Vegas. I love it loads. I won a, oh, crikey, what year was it? I think it was 2007. I did a competition for the family entertainer of the southeast or something weird it was a bit of a weird one i never did it again It was like a little mini convention and i won a trip to vegas that was my first time and ever since i went i went back there again for my 40th birthday i love vegas so much to have a show even a small run of a show carl and dave or even on my own or whatever i prefer carl and well, dave easy you. ways for having carl and dave or or you on your own to go on Fool Us, win, and then you're going to get invited to the Penn and Teller Theatre. Yeah, that, that, I don't think we got, I don't think I've got any little full Penn and Teller. <laughs> like I say, focus on the comedy, worry about the magic later. There's nothing that's going to fall, there's nothing that's going to fall Penn and Teller, but I wouldn't mind doing it. I'd love, I'd love to do it. Yeah, I would love to do it, definitely. But yeah, Vegas, I love Vegas. I think Vegas is, is, uh, a, a, you know, a fantastic place. I do like it, and uh, that would be certainly I was saying I would love to do maybe in the future. You know, I think the thing about performing is I personally think it's ageless, you know, so I can do that whenever. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm going to carry on doing what I'm doing. I love doing the family shows, you know, uh, a four year old birthday party, I'm completely fine with doing the wedding for a close up, love it. Carl and Dave at Holiday Park, love it. I love it all. You know, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, and then the other business, this, this business will just run as well. I can keep my ear to the ground and make sure I give it the flair that it needs. And how do you, a genuine question here, how do you juggle your time? Five kids, new baby, magic circle, <laughs> shop, Carl and Dave. And by the way, for people watching this, if a normal magician just had the amount of gigs that Carl and Dave do on their own, outside of everything else that you do, they'd be going, well, that's been a good year. And that's just <laughs> one little part of what you do. <laughs> Add on all the stuff that you do individually yourself and family time and time. You, I know you're quite active in the, the wham and how the bloody hell do you find time to do all of this, Dave? I don't know, you're making me feel a bit like, I don't know. I don't know how I do it either. Um, <laughs> It's really, I just, I just get on with it. That's the thing. So there's so many people that when they want to do something, they just kind of, 
just like ask around and they're just like if I, if I want to do something I just I just do it you know I don't I don't spend I just I I, I work a lot you know so I I have I am guilty of not really switching off I will sometimes be sort of lying in bed and go oh oh I know what I need to do and then I'll go on the computer and I'll type something out or send an email or you know write down a note or something you know but I think all the you know a lot of business people are, are the same I just I I I just, I'm just passionate about, I know I've said it before, I don't want to sound cliche, but, you know, I'm just passionate about whatever it is I do. And I just, I just always work. So I'm always, you know, I like to be in control. So with all the websites and design and logos, you know, I design everything. I just, I grab everything and I want to be in control of it all. Um, so I'm just, I'm just always working. I think it's the best way to describe what I do. You know, uh, if, like I say, it's, what time is it now? It's half past five now even though the shop's closed at four o'clock, you know, if someone knocked on the door now and wanted to come in and have a chat about bikes and stuff, I'll let them in and we'll have a chat, you know? Um, I just, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I just get on with it. <laughs> get on with it and stop moaning. That's what I do. That's the best, the best. <laughs> the best, well, you know what, mate, whatever you do, um, I, 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 I know it's going to be a success because, You've always been successful at everything that you've done. You've always put 110% in. Like you've said yourself in this interview over and over again, go big or go home. And every single time I've seen you do anything, you've always gone big. And you are one of my favorite people in magic. And uh, although I love you as an act on your own, you and Carl are just magic. You know, I think the two of you together are just absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much for finding the time to come on the channel. Now, people that want to check you out, uh, do we have any socials? Can people check out Carl and Dave and you on your own? And Yeah, stuff? yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're all available. So uh, hashtag my pink bin gets you a lot of Carl and Dave stuff. Um, <laughs> don't ask. That's, that's a question <laughs> for another interview. That is a question. <laughs> don't for ask. Yeah, um, yeah carlanddave.com, um, um, magicdave.co.uk, and um, what else? Alan'sEbikes.co.uk. If you want a bike, might as well try. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm all, I'm all out. I'm, I'm out there all over the internet. You mentioned that bike. you are available as a lecturer, and you do you have magic that you sell. Where's yeah. that? People want to look at that stuff. Do you have a, a website for that, or is it just contact? Uh, yeah, so it's all connected uh, via links on uh, magicdave.co.uk. So you can see all the information on, on magic stuff that I sell. But although, like I say, there's not a lot. Uh, there's no, I've got one red lorry, yellow lorry that's all still in the box, unopened. I'm never going to sell that. I'm just going to keep that as a kind of memorabilia. But, you know, a lot of that magic stuff has sold. Um, and I am going to be doing another lecture. Uh, I had a new lecture that was going to be at a convention called Tricks in the Sticks, which I was supposed to do last year, but also got cancelled. So I am going to be doing that in 2022. So brand new lecture. I've got some ideas running around in my head for some new products and new bits and pieces and uh, maybe a twist on the older version of uh, Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, what I'm, I'm working on in my head. Um, so, yeah, the, I'm going to be doing other things just uh yeah <laughs> there's always stuff going on but yeah i'm all over the internet talk me in pop, pop, pop. all the socials are down below and they're in the description down below as well make sure that you check them all out and it's been great having you on the show dave thank you so much i really appreciate it and, thank you uh, and and i'm sure i'll see you again at some point soon in the future Guys, uh, leave a comment down below. Dave might see it, and if he does, he will answer. Uh, check him out on his socials, and don't forget to check out Cracklejack, or, or just check out Carl and Dave. The guys are brilliant. If you haven't seen them perform, make sure you check it out. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video if you want to see more videos like this. Leave a comment down below, and I'll be back again tomorrow with another video at 2 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. I'll see you then. Thanks very much. My name's Craig from Magic TV.